So my name's Professor Jenny Shaw. I'm Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Adelaide. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and of the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses here at North Adelaide, Waite and Roseworthy are built. Thank you all for coming along tonight. It's great that the rain stopped, isn't it? So we all got here dry, <laughs> in a dry fashion. Um, tonight's Research Tuesday's event I think will be really interesting. It's called, of course, Home Ground Disadvantage, as you can see behind me. We've all heard or read about in the media that we're in a housing crisis, that housing prices are unsustainable and that millennials will never own their own home. It's a pretty bleak picture. So today we have brought together our best researchers in housing who will put it all out on the table for us and discuss what's really happening in Australia, how we are faring when compared to other countries and what the future might hold. This evening's event will start by a presentation by Professor Chris Leishman, Director of the Centre for Housing, Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Adelaide. Following Chris's presentation, an additional three speakers will join Chris for a panel discussion. During this discussion, the group will debate a range of topics associated with housing. Then the group will leave some time at the end of the event to respond to questions from you here in the audience. So let's get the, the evening underway. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Chris Leishman. As I mentioned, Chris is the Director of the Centre for Housing, Urban and Regional Planning, or CHIRP, as it's known within the university. He's also a Professor of Housing Economics. And he directs the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute's Adelaide Research Centre. Prior to joining us at the University of Adelaide, Chris worked at universities in Scotland, including as a Professor of Housing Economics at Harriet Watt University and as Professor of Housing and Urban Economics at the University of Glasgow. He is interested in the relationship between housing supply and affordability, the behaviour of housing and land developers, and demographic socioeconomic processes such as household formation, housing consumption decisions and tenure choice. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you everyone for giving up your time this evening and coming in to hear a little bit more about the work we do in housing-related uh, research at the University of Adelaide. The, the topic for this evening, of course, is home ground disadvantage, but in particular, we're going to be talking about housing affordability um, and asking the question, does Australia have a, a housing affordability crisis? We're going to ask what does housing affordability and unaffordability look like? What do these concepts actually mean? Who are the people being affected by these problems? But in particular, how can we actually cut through these problems and start devising um, policy solutions? And we're mindful, of course, that we have a housing system which creates many winners as well as some losers. For example, um, we have a great deal of housing wealth stored up in housing stock. Housing has become a very important mechanism for maintaining well-being and income in retirement. It's a, it's a method of saving and generating wealth, and it creates financial stability. So we're mindful that we don't want to um, look at the system and fundamentally alter it, but, but we want to actually ask, how can we make sure that there's adequate housing consumption for all Australians? And we'll explain later why that's actually important. So what did the data show? Um, the graph at, on the left-hand side shows housing costs in Australia over the last 20 years or so, and the figures are in real terms, so they're in 2006 prices. And what we can see in particular is over the last 10 or 15 years, um, the cost of um, having an owner-occupied dwelling has increased quite dramatically. The cost of privately renting a dwelling has also increased quite significantly, and even the cost actually of renting social, in the social rented sector has increased quite significantly. I think it's important to note, actually, that there's a difference between housing costs and housing values. These are terms which are confused and used interchangeably um, by the public and by the media as well. Housing values refer to house prices, so these are asset prices. What we're really interested in, actually, in housing costs and affordability are the week-to-week -week costs that people have to make. So that's the weekly rent, uh, or the monthly mortgage cost, how much are they actually paying, and how big is that um, sum with respect to ongoing income. These are the things that really matter rather than 
the balance sheet, um, housing asset values. And what we know that, uh, is that in Australia, there are quite a significant number of people who are paying a lot of their income, actually, in terms of housing costs. Policymakers begin to think that there might be a problem for individual people where they're in the bottom 40% of the income distribution, but they're paying 30% or more of their income in housing costs. And we know that that applies to something like 30%. Nearly a third of all private renters are actually paying that sum of money um, from their income, which is getting to that unsustainable level where it could be triggering other problems. We'll define those problems in, in, in a few minutes. Um, and about 15% of owners are also paying mortgage costs, which are so high that it could be becoming a policy problem. In terms of who that is, well, um, we know that there's a strong age effect, that younger people in particular, so people in the 20 to 29 age group at the moment, have got a particularly high burden of housing costs. Um, and the, the problem seems to uh, diminish uh, with age group as well. So older households don't have the same problems that younger households do. This may be fairly obvious. But it's not the whole story, actually, because um, statistics from the last census, the 2016 census, shows it's not just a younger person's issue. Um, that actually, we've got a very much a changing set of dynamics in the housing system. There are more older people with mortgages now than ever before. Um, it used to be the case that people over 55 would rarely have a mortgage. Perhaps one third of them might have a mortgage 10 or 15 years ago. And it's something like 50% of, of older people now still have a mortgage. Um, the prediction is that something like 20% of uh, older households will actually be private renters 40 years from now, uh, which is also an alarming statistic. Um, and finally, homelessness rate is actually increasing for older households at a faster rate than any other age group. So it's not just restricted to younger people, although clearly they are a particular concern. We can ask, why does it actually matter if people end up paying a lot of money for their housing? Um, and what we can say, that as well as uh, the moral arguments, um, there are some important impacts that begin to happen to people when uh, they're paying um, high housing costs. In particular, they are likely to start um, experiencing what we call material deprivation. Material deprivation is one form, one measurement of poverty, and it literally means the uh, deprived of material things. So that's the sort of things that uh, the majority of people take for granted that are necessities for living. So the way these measures often work, actually, is that we have two surveys. Um, one survey establishes what things are essentials, what things are necessities for people to live. Um, and the survey is usually of the general public, and, and you're at, people are asked, do you think it's essential to have a washing machine? Do you think it's essential to have two pairs of shoes? Is it essential to have a warm coat? So these are the things that, t that people tend to agree are essentials to live. Um, it's things uh, like being able to buy children, um, uh, new school clothes with each school year, and uh, to have friends around for dinner without having to worry too much about the costs of that. So that's material deprivation. There's usually a long list of 40 or 50 items. When people lack three of these, three or more, we can accept they're actually moving into material deprivation. They're beginning to lack those essentials that people need to live. Um, and high housing costs mean that people are much more likely to begin moving into that um, measure of poverty. They're beginning to lack those things which uh, are regarded as essentials for living a normal life in this country. In fact, only a relatively small proportion of people are in this category. Um, something like 3.5% um, of people are experiencing quite unaffordable housing, and also they've moved into material deprivation. So in a sense, there's a positive message here in that people are quite resilient. They can actually live um, with very high burden of costs for quite a long time before it begins to impact on their lives in terms of not being able to afford um, everyday essentials. But for those 3.5% of people, of households, actually the impacts are pretty severe. So they're actually much, much worse off than um, the majority of the population. They're very poor. Uh, it can trigger um, a myriad of interrelated problems, such as welfare dependency, um, unemployment, uh, financial instability. 
And of course, there are knock-on effects to other generations. So it's been quite clearly shown by research evidence that when children are raised in poverty, when they experience child poverty as they're growing up, it does actually impact on educational attainment. Then, of course, that impacts on their life chances. So there's um, a self-perpetuating problem in that people growing up in poverty then face circumstances in which they struggle, actually, to, uh, to live in mainstream. Housing affordability is also a health issue. Now, about 10 years ago, there was very sketchy evidence about this, but uh, CHIRP, our, our research centre, has been developing a, a strong evidence base which shows that, actually, as housing becomes unaffordable, there are greater and greater impacts on people. Um, in particular, when people spend a long time in unaffordable housing, uh, the, the impacts on their mental health begin to accelerate, so they begin to compound and get more severe. Um, and also, when people experience many different types of housing problems, so by that I mean unaffordable housing, but it also could be dampness, um, leaking windows, uh, and so on, uh, the more ex uh, housing problems they have, the more severe the physical health impacts actually are. And this affects something like 10%. Um, of Australians who are living in unaffordable housing. So it's not just a, a few people, but it's a very significant um, uh, swathe of our population. So uh, as, as an economist, occasionally uh, we can pontificate and think, well, what does this actually mean? Why is this actually happening? And um, the economics literature isn't well known uh, for being uh, particularly interesting. Um, but some interesting insights do come out of it. And uh, economics can be used to try and explain why people behave in different markets. And in the housing market, there are things that they do that are quite rational and other th types of behavior that are quite irrational. So wanting to become a homeowner is you know, widely regarded as part of the Australian dream. Um, housing aspiration studies over the years in lots of developed countries, in the UK and in Australia, they repeatedly show that the main thing that people aspire to is to own their own home. Why is that? Well, the rational reasons are, of course, it generates financial stability. Um, in retirement, it, it lets you build up wealth. It lets you pass on wealth to future generations. And it gives um, social stability as well. So when you own your own home, you've got complete control over that, over that destiny. Um, you have a sense of belonging and meaning in terms of owning and uh, occupying that home. No one can come along and tell you to leave, that they want to sell the rental investment and disrupt you. So those are quite rational reasons. But there's also irrational reasons, and the research evidence does show actually that people are drawn to housing investment partly because of um, distrust of other types of investment. So on the top right, we have a graph here which shows um, the international price of gold. And what we can see, um, this is a very simple example, but in the run-up to the global financial crisis, gold prices began to rocket as the financial institutions got very nervous uh, about the state of the markets. And they stayed very high, actually, for some years after the global financial crisis due to sovereign debt worries. Um, and now they're beginning uh, to come under control again. When we look at individual people, they have similar responses. So when people distrust their pension funds, this is a huge issue in the UK, it's less important in Australia, but it's nevertheless an issue. Um, they're drawn to physical assets. The thing about housing is it's physical, it exists, it's a bricks and mortar investment, um, and lots of people feel that it has some security, it's safer, it's less likely to vanish. Um, um, it's not just on balance sheet, but it's a physical thing that exists. Um, so many people are drawn to it for that reason, and the evidence shows actually that it's lower and moderate income people are particularly uh, likely to think in that way. Um, so later we'll talk about negative gearing, for example, and some other tax measures um, which benefit higher income people, but actually the greatest love comes from lower and moderate income people, and it's because of this, what economists call psychic income. Psychic income meaning there's a value in doing something which comes um, way beyond the numbers. Um, so, for example, uh, what some workers love their job so much that they would do it for a lower salary. Um, university professors might fall into this category, of course. Um, and equally, though, there's a love of owning property 
it's this thing which is tangible, you can see it and you can trust it. And uh, people want to own property even though the financial returns are not always very good. You can actually get a better financial return by investing in capital markets. So there's a sort of irrationality at, at work in the system as well, which policymakers have to deal with at, at some point. Now, on the bottom right, there's a, a, an excerpt from a, a British study that we carried out a few years ago. And actually, it showed that a lot of people experience poverty. So this is using a similar measure of deprivation. It's looking at uh, people in poverty measured by income or poverty measured by not being able to afford necessities. And what we found actually is that if you look at over a 20 year period, a lot of people, and particularly homeowners, actually do experience poverty. Something like 25% of people experience poverty. But for them, it's not really a big problem because they've bought a house, they've bought um, as much as they can afford, they've borrowed the biggest mortgage they can afford. Technically, they're in poverty, they're feeling a bit of pain. But you know, a couple of years later, once their salaries are rising and the debt's coming under control, they're absolutely fine, okay? So they're not really a policy worry. For people that gear themselves up and uh, force themselves into poverty because they're paying that mortgage, they're not really a, po uh, a, po a policy concern. The policy concern is the bit on the left. This 10% of people actually who end up in what's called chronic poverty, so year in, year out, um, they can't afford essentials, they can't afford to live properly, the evidence shows actually it's the length of time in poverty which causes the damage. So if you're a new homeowner and technically you're in poverty or deprivation for one or two years, it's probably going to have no lasting impact on you. But if you're in poverty for 10 years, that's when people start running out of things to sell. Um, they've got no more credit lines and they begin running out of options. That's where the policy problems come in. So what I'd like to do now is just talk about a couple of um, popular solutions. Um, housing affordability is a wicked problem in that it's going to be quite difficult to cure it. Four things are, are suggested quite often in, in the media um, as, as uh, possible solutions to housing unaffordability. One of them is negative gearing. Um, now Australia does have negative gearing uh, rules over taxation. Out with Australia, this is baffling to people. Um, the fact that you could borrow money, um, buy a private rental investment, make a loss, and then offset it against income is, is baffling. So when I explain to colleagues back in the UK that this exists, that it really is disbelief. Um, that it is quite an unusual system. Is it all bad? Well, I mean, looking at the data, um, Australia does seem quite unusual, actually, in that rent, rental costs are lower than mortgage costs for many properties. Thinking about the UK, uh, you could have two identical properties side by side, one for rent and one you could buy in a mortgage. Generally speaking, the rental property would be more expensive in the UK. The opposite is true in Australia, that rental properties are actually cheaper. So it does look as though that this tax concession has boosted the supply of rental property and that's helped to keep prices under control. Um, but there is an analogy. The UK did have a similar tax uh, concession in the, in the 1980s. It had mortgage interest relief at source, or MIRAS. Um, and that was actually for owner occupiers. It wasn't for private rental investors. And the government came to the view, actually, they had to withdraw the subsidy. It was, it was crazy to let fairly wealthy people actually build up more and more wealth through owning housing um, when it was growing inequality. It was a political football, it eventually got passed. Um, but the commentators that said the market will crash, they were wrong, nothing happened, it continued growing. And as younger people came through and sort of buying housing, they didn't even know anything about Myris, they didn't realize it once existed. It didn't really um, change anything fundamentally. Um, so the conclu my conclusion there really is, yes, negative gearing probably is something that has to be um, addressed. But I wouldn't expect any massive adjustment on prices when that actually happens. Should it be reformed? Almost certainly yes. Um, partly because um, of the concept of investment neutrality. It's not possible to use this tax concession to buy shares, for example. Um, it's only specific to the housing system. So it's a deliberate distortion um, to increase people's wealth. Another important lesson from housing economics history is that historic patterns um, have got a habit of persisting. 
In the UK, it took massive house building programs, social rented house building programs, uh, to try and disrupt patterns of disadvantage. Um, and similar interventions would be needed in Australia to bring housing unaffordability back under control. The concept of path dependency is very important as well. In the UK, uh, Myris did exist for decades, and little by little it, it pushed up prices. So it ends up with very, very high prices. The problem is that just withdrawing that tax concession doesn't then reinvent the past. That 20 or 30 years still happened. Prices are still high. So there's a very marginal effect on prices. The same thing will happen in Australia if negative gearing is abolished. Prices aren't going to revert back to what they were 20 or 30 years ago. It's just that there's a slightly weaker incentive now for people to invest in rental um, properties. Another conclusion I would draw then is that having a plan is a good thing. In the UK, um, housing policy doesn't always work effectively, but Myris is one example of something that was successful. It was planned out carefully. There was a 10-year plan to gradually withdraw uh, Myris, so it came down little by little and, until it became meaningless and it was then finally withdrawn. Something similar could happen in Australia, for example. A second popular solution that often, you often see in, in, in the newspapers and here on the radio is that the housing affordability crisis is easy to fix. All we need to do is build a lot more houses. Um, and in fact, if we look at the graph in the top right, Australia used to have an enormous supply of new built housing compared to the size of the housing stock and, and, and uh, the volume of second-hand transactions. And indeed, that has fallen uh, quite considerably over the last 20 years. But partly that's because the housing stock is getting bigger and the country is becoming more mature in terms of its society, its economy, and its housing system. If we look at the graph at the, on the bottom, what we actually see is that Australia has actually got a quite a high supply of new built housing. It's the second highest in the OECD block, so it's only uh, just coming behind Korea. And it's, got about, it's adding about 2% to the housing stock each year. Uh, in most European countries, it would be about 1%. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, it's only about half, half of 1% now in, in the UK. So the new build supply that Australia has actually would be a politician's dream in, in the UK. Uh, they would love to achieve such a high um, housing supply. Housing supply is also a term which is used wrongly quite often. When we say housing supply, most people think about new build transactions. They think about developers building and selling housing, and that's what new supply, housing supply means. But in fact, most housing supply comes from the existing stock. Um, so this is the size of the uh, housing stock in South Australia, just under 450,000 um, dwellings. Um, and it generates uh, a second-hand supply of something like 40, 45,000 dwellings. This da these data relate to 2016. Um, and something like 8,000 uh, dwellings are built new each year. So the importance of housing supply um, as it relates to housing stock is very simple. The big blue bit is the stock of housing, and people supply housing to the market for various reasons. They leave the state, move somewhere else, they go abroad, they downsize or they die, and people inherit the housing and then sell it back to the market. So there's an, an organic supply, and that supply is typically 10 to 20 times the size of the new build supply. Okay? The thing that policymakers can do something about is that red bit on the right is the new build supply, and it's a very small proportion of overall housing supply. So it's actually very difficult to pull that policy lever and um, greatly increase the supply of housing overall. The UK, of course, tried this. In 2004, it published a major um, government review of the housing system. They came to the conclusion that the planning system was too strict, there wasn't enough land, uh, and it was a 10-year program of reform to boost the amount of land available for, for house building. Um, that came by weakening the planning system deliberately so that land supply would increase. Um, but the result was quite disappointing, actually. So there was a huge boost in supply of land. There was an increase in supply of new housing. Um, but there wasn't really much of an effect on prices. And just as this 10-year uh, experiment was coming to an end, of course, the global financial crisis came and disrupted this experiment. Um, 
But the conclusion is that it takes decades, literally decades, of higher new build supply to start pushing down prices. A second conclusion from this actually is we need to think about developers and take into account their behavior. Uh, the intense competition among them and the uh, struggle to find enough land to buy, and they tend to operate to quite small profit margins. So the question is, if we were successful in boosting new supply in Australia, who would actually buy all of those extra houses? It's something that has to pan out over several decades rather than you know, a, a once-fits-all uh, solution. So I'd argue that the new housing supply is important. Yes, we should probably boost it and build more houses in Australia, but it's not a magic solution to the housing affordability problem. This map shows um, Ad Adelaide and its surrounds um, and where uh, prices have grown uh, over the last 10 years. So the, the, the bright red areas, prices have grown uh, highest over the last 10 years. And what we can see is the city's done very well. Um, the eastern and western suburbs have had high price growth. The dots, the blue dots, show the location of people on moderate incomes who actually are homeowners and are paying more than 30% of their income and housing costs. And, and there's a very clear pattern. There's a, really nobody in the central areas or the eastern and western suburbs. Um, the areas where people have that moderate income and are struggling to pay the mortgage are in the far north of the city and, um, and the southern suburbs, particularly along the coast. When we read through the map, look at an even lower income group, so these are people with less than $500 a week uh, of income and are struggling to pay um, uh, their, their mortgage, they've got high housing costs. What we can see is actually there's a much wider spatial pattern. We can, we can see that the, the north of the city and the suburbs to the, w and the west and the southwest are still there. But actually, there's been quite significant price growth northeast and northwest of Adelaide city centre. Um, and we can actually find a lot of people there who are on that very low income. They are nevertheless homeowners, and they're beginning to struggle to pay those mortgage costs. I'm beginning to run to the end now of um, my brief overview of housing and affordability. I want to ask just a couple more questions. First, the, ha the housing system has a habit of sorting people, and that's a policy problem, potentially. So wealthy people tend to buy houses in wealthy areas and congregate together. Um, they then make sure that schools are good quality and public services are good quality there, and it starts creating path dependency. It means that life chances of those people are improved, which is great. But people um, who cannot afford housing and move to poor areas also then tend to enter this problem of path dependency. This graph here shows um, the index of socioeconomic advantage and disadvantage, which is published by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And what we've actually done is plot that index for people who are in uh, affordable housing versus unaffordable housing. And what we can see over time is that the people who are not really struggling to meet the housing costs, the kind of area they live in is actually getting better and better, more advantaged over time, over the last 15 years. The people who are living in unaffordable housing and are struggling to meet those costs are actually living in poorer and poorer, more deprived areas over time. Now, we don't really know why this is. We need to actually do some more research. Um, to find out. Uh, uh, every research project ends with, the, with this conclusion, of course, that there's a need for a, a new research project. Um, in this case, this is a tantalizing finding. It's probably quite an alarming finding, actually. What does it mean? Does it mean that people are actually um, l moving into deprived areas trying to pursue affordable housing opportunities? Or does it mean that people are, who are living with unaffordable housing, their areas are getting more and more deprived over time? Whichever it is, it's an important policy question that we should consider. So should we be worried about this, and is it actually a crisis? Well, the situation is getting worse. Um, house prices are going up, and people are beginning to struggle more and more to access the market. We've already looked at evidence to show that it does impact on people. So it impacts on people's standards of living. Some people cannot afford things that we all regard as essentials to live, necessities. We've shown that um, people's health can be impacted, that's mental and physical health, by poor quality housing conditions, and that people are beginning to commute longer distances, subjecting themselves to higher costs and, and longer commutes. That also causes a loss of well-being for people. 
But there may also be economic effects, and the, the Australian government's quite concerned about this now. Um, people withdraw from labour markets, they leave cities, um, they can't compete, they can't find housing close to where job opportunities exist. And so that actually has a knock-on impact to economic productivity. Um, so Australia, of course, used to be a country, to an extent still is, where migrants could come and through hard work and opportunities could access good quality, relatively affordable housing and re-establish a better life. So the question is, is that Australian dream now being undermined by this uh, housing affordability crisis? And on that note, I'd like to just um, end my lecture and introduce uh, the panel discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Do you want to take one of the seats down in front of me and I'll introduce our panellists. So um, Professor Michael Lennon will be chairing this panel discussion and um, Michael, if you want to come up to the front as well. So Michael comes to us from Housing Choices Australia where he's the Managing Director. Housing Choices Australia is a national not-for-profit community housing provider with significant property and property management interests in South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. With more than 20 years experience in housing, planning and urban development, we're privileged to have Michael participate in our discussion tonight. And I should also note that um, Professor Michael Lennon is an adjunct professor here at the University of Adelaide. Um, also from the University of Adelaide is our own, our very own Associate Professor Emma Baker. So Emma, I wonder if you could come up the front now. A geographer by training, Emma leads the university's Healthy Cities Research Group and her research focus is on the role of housing and residential location in improving health and well-being. And last but not least, we have Dr. Lirian Daniel. So Lirian, if you'd come up too. So Lirian has a background in architectural science and is a research fellow in the university's Healthy Cities Research Group. Lirian's PhD sought to understand the thermal behaviours and preferences of households living in low energy dwellings. Um, so here we have our panel, uh, Michael, Emma, Chris and Lirian. And I'm going to take a seat in the front row and let you kick it off. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, um, Jenny, and um, good evening, everyone. I, too, would like to pay my respects to the Ghana people and pay my respects to the elders past and present. As will um, become obvious, um, there's a degree of cultural bias this evening um, in that um, I too am Scottish. So if um, Chris and I get excited, <clears throat> this might end up being discussion amongst two people because nobody else will be able to understand us. So I'll endeavor to speak slowly and um, concentrate on my vowels. Um, housing is a, a wicked problem as uh, Chris identified wicked in the sense that it's multi-dimensional. There is no silver bullet, there is no single answer. Um, it, is, it is multifaceted both in terms of the contributions to the problem, but also in terms of the consequences. Um, in this next um, period of time, I'm going to ask each of the panel members some questions, but in that period, I'd like you to think about why this issue is important to yourself and to your own experiences in life, and we're gonna allow um, 10 or 15 minutes to comments and contributions from the floor. But um, to kick things off, um, Chris, I might come back to some of the matters that you raised in your presentation. Um, Chris talked about the impact of housing supply, and he did so because the common and prevailing view, certainly in national economic policy settings, is that undersupply is the root of the problem. That if, in fact, the, um, the restrictions to supply could be overcome, people could access the housing they need, and they could do so at better and more affordable prices. So this is the view of the Federal Treasury and Treasurer, um, the Reserve Bank, who, um, who argue this case often, and, um, and indeed the Productivity Commission. So the, the question, Chris, would be um, why and how does housing supply impact differentially at different income points on the income distribution? What are the impacts for people according to their income status? Uh, thank you, Michael. Is this, is this visible, audible, rather? Um, I think this, there's a long-running debate, actually, about how housing supply, new-build housing su supply, actually lowers prices. Um, and just thinking about the housing economics literature, it's a bit boring, but uh, there's some interesting lessons there. Um, 
in particular, right-wing governments tend to have this view that actually um, you can build housing at the very top of the market, and what will happen is it will trickle down and affect everybody. Um, that was a popular view in the 80s in the UK. So as long as you build very expensive, high-quality housing, the most affluent people in society will buy it. Um, and then what will happen then is they'll cause a vacancy in the, in the next best quality housing, and this vacancy chain will trickle down, and actually everybody will benefit. Um, but the evidence actually shows that you have to build housing of whole different uh, ranges of quality and price, and at different po points in the city. People tend to be buying new built housing for particular reasons. Uh, they tend not to travel very far. Um, People like their neighbourhoods, they like their sector of the city, and they don't actually want to migrate very far within cities. So a more progressive way of arguing this actually is that new supply is important, but it really has to be supplied everywhere within the city and at different price levels. Does that answer the question, Michael? Um, yeah, yes, it does. Um, um, and, and Chris, the, the supply um, impacts are obviously um, more sharply felt for people on lesser income. So you can pay a higher proportion of um, your household income if you have greater disposable um, wealth. But obviously the opposite is the case as well. In this discussion, um, housing policy has, has divided and, uh, between kind of two sides of the, of the um, uh, the spectrum of interventions that government might have. So um, uh, demand side interventions are typically involving payments and the transfer of money to enable people to purchase and supply side interventions are more about the provision of bricks and mortar. Um, what have been the relative trends between those two policy emphases, um, Chris, and how do we strike balance amongst them? Well, that, that's, a, that's an enormous question, actually, Michael, as, as I'm sure you know. But I think that internationally, the cost of housing subsidies has been growing you know, quite, at quite an alarming rate. So Commonwealth rent assistance, the bill is getting bigger and bigger in Australia. In, uh, in the UK, the housing benefit bill is getting larger and larger and causing a great deal of concern to the government. Uh, and so there's been uh, you know, uh, a policy move to try and control that bill, to try and squeeze it, uh, squeeze it down. It's also, I think, it's robbed um, um, housing subsidies from the supply side as well. Um, and my view is actually that both things are needed. But uh, ha supply side subsidies uh, are useful for producing housing, social rented housing for people who really have no chance of accessing the market at all. The demand side subsidies are useful for uh, facilitating access to, to home ownership, for example, and for assisted private rental. But the difficulty is these policies are really blunt. So having introduced them, uh, they're uh, equally available t to all subject to means testing. But one difficulty about home ownership, for example, is that um, house price might be a house price, but actually what it costs somebody to occupy that house is very different depending on their own circumstances. So a wealthy household, for example, will get a much lower mortgage rate offer than a, a, a low income household with no credit history. So the same house costs the same to both households, but actually it's considerably cheaper to the household that already has wealth. So it's easy to buy that and supply it back as a, as a rental investment. And so I think we need better designed demand side policies actually that can discriminate and, and give opportunities to people who are on lower income and of less sort of credit worthiness. And and just to reinforce the importance of these trends, Chris, in Australia, for those of you who have um, been through the last three or four decades, in Australia, we now spend four times as much on rental assistance for private landlords as we do on the um, outlays for the supply of low-income, social and affordable housing. There has been a dramatic shift um, in our willingness to fund supply-side interventions um, at the same time as the, the, the net income of the country has increased dramatically. So there's something about the political priority that we're able to assert um, and, uh, and the dominance of a particular view over the other. But I might turn to um, uh, Emma at this stage. Um, Emma, as many of you might know, has um, uh, considerable experience and expertise in social policy and demography and, um, and, and in geography, her original discipline. Um, but Emma, in the literature, there are, there are particular cohorts which are now emerging of particular concern. 
Um, I'd be interested in your perspective of who these are. And for example, particularly the concern that we've seen in recent times about the emergence of older women amongst the homelessness demographic. Um, uh, who are these people? Why are these circumstances um, getting worse? Um, I, I think my, my thinking on the cohorts has changed a little bit over time. Um, I think you kind of think about cohorts in two ways. First, if you look at individual effects, a lot of what we're looking at at the moment in our research is, is you know, how, how can you measure the individual effects of things like housing affordability? What, what really seems to be shining out is, um, you know, for example, you might be affected by not being able to pay your rent or making the judgment about whether, whether to pay your rent or feed your children fresh vegetables. But you also might be affected by housing affordability, by um, the quality of housing that you can afford. So, so if, if you can't afford to pay a lot in a housing market, you might end up only in a house that's cold. And as a result, your family. So, so there's all of these ways that housing affects health and well-being. So I think, I think I've, I've come to the position where the cohort that I think are most vulnerable are the people with multiple housing problems. And, and, and to some extent, that then takes the, the kind of the focus away from just affordability. So I, I think one thing we're in danger of at the moment is just focusing only on affordable housing. Mm. And that maybe we should be looking at, you know, who are the people in our population who have unaffordable housing and terrible quality housing that's also poor, poorly located. And then, you know, you whack on a, a disability or a long-term illness on top of that. And the ability to cope with that becomes really difficult. So, so I think if you look at it, as an individual, I think it's people who have unaffordable housing and other things going on. Um, I suppose on the upside, you then turn the argument around from looking at 10% of the population with unaffordable housing to maybe just 1% or 3% of the population who are affected by lots of things going on. So I think it gives you a kind of a, a target to, to look at as well. I mean, that, that answers the first part of your question. Yep. Um, I think though, like reflecting on, on Chris's, Chris's talk, if you look at the population level, I'm most concerned about the people who are just missing out on getting into the home ownership market. So in the long term, you know, there's a whole group of people every year who just miss out on getting into home ownership. And then we do things, you know, with the tax system that, that helps and preferences people who are homeowners. And then by the time they, they reach retirement age, um, they're in, in a bit of a pickle because they don't have the asset and also they're paying rent through their retirement. So that makes them kind of, it's the double whammy effect, effectively. And I suppose then that, that takes you to the second part of your question, <laughs> which is older women. Um, I actually think that older women are probably a little bit invisible in this discussion, in that, um, in that maybe in the past, you know, in South Australia, in, um, in 1966 in South Australia, 18% of our housing stock was public housing. And most of that public housing served the needs of older, poorer women mm -hmm. who, who couldn't live in the private sector. So now we've kind of shrunk it down to about 4% of the, of the housing stock, and we're focusing on people with look, high and complex needs. So there's a whole group of older women that are now either kind of compromising on their housing um, or, or um, uh, living in, you know, either the private rental sector in poorer quality housing. So, yeah, I think, I think they're the big invisible losers uh, in, in this. And there's a related point, Emma, about um, comorbidity, comorbidity being expressed, um, especially with people who can get through the avenues into social or affordable housing because it's a, it's a rationed resource. But you end up obviously in, with concentrations of disadvantage as a consequence. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, and I think you know, some, of, some of the work that Lurian and I have been doing, we've, we've spent last winter out interviewing people in their houses to you know, find out about cold and warmth and, and, and you know, some, of the, some of the living situations of older people is, is, is terrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, we might come on to, um, to the research interests of, of uh, Lirian because um, at the risk of um, saying the bleeding obvious, Lirian, um, somebody in a, um, who's living in a park compared to a dry, warm house is likely to do worse. But having said that, it's a whole lot more complicated to prove that. So um, from your experience, what real evidence do we now have about the contribution of housing costs and conditions to the so-called social determinants of health? 
So I guess we have um, we have quite a few bits of really good evidence about the contribution of housing and housing costs and conditions to our health. So some of the things that Emma touched on, for example, housing affordability um, can impact on our mental health or living in a cold home can um, worsen cardiovascular disease or um, cause asthma symptoms or respiratory, respiratory problems. Um, I guess the problem with this is that the, the gold standard for this type of research is to um, pull it apart or pull apart um, people's experience of housing problems and, and look at them in isolation. So maybe just focusing on one cause and effect um, per research study. Um, the problem that we have um, when we um, need to make, I guess, a policy story or argument around this is actually fitting all of those separate bits of research or evidence um, back together in a compelling way that really lends itself to policy analysis, for example, cost-benefit analysis. So. Um, Perhaps it's a little bit easier to um, quantify the benefit of a, a big sort of piece of public infrastructure like a road, you know, um, it's about getting more people from A to B more quickly, but um, maybe it's a bit harder to, to do that with housing or housing solutions. Um, part of this is because um, housing um, is so complex, it serves many masters, it serves the investor, the tenant, um, the homeowner uh, preparing for retirement. Um, so the complex, so people's um, experience of housing problems are, are quite varied. Um, so the effects on health are going to be similarly varied. So um, referring to some of um, Emma's recent work, um, I, I guess it, part of this work is arguing that perhaps um, it's not as useful to look at these um, housing problems separately in isolation and maybe it's really the bundle of housing problems um, that people experience um, at the same time that really matters. Um, and I guess um, advances in analytical techniques and access, for example, to linked administrative data are really for the first time allowing us to properly look at some of these issues in a more holistic way. So the hope is that um, sort of this emerging evidence that, that's sort of formed as a, a bundle or as a set of things um, can help us to more convincingly um, tell a policy story about um, how uh, housing problems can affect our health um, and then also um, more easily um, be able to quantify uh, the benefits of, of policy in addressing those. Yeah. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about really simple um, observations you can make that whenever we have a heat wave we regularly count the number of frail people who die mm. during that time but we don't seem to be able to take them into account when we make investment decisions and similarly I think many people in the audience would remember in the 1990s and beyond when we went around systematically and we closed around all the big bad mental um, mental health institutions in Australia, the ones that were characterised in one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And we were never going to have that again. So we closed down the institutions, but we didn't put anything in their place. And so you'll see, um, for example, a, a huge in in incidence amongst the homeless population of people with um, serious medical conditions, serious mental illness. Um, but we, we don't seem to have a method of combining the analysis of both of those. So, um, so Lirian, in terms of where the research takes us, um, how do we try to frame investment decisions that can be more persuasive and powerful than they are at the present time? I think it's really about um, perhaps trying to understand how all of these things fit together um, within quite a complex, um, I guess, context, and and then. Um, how these experiences might vary for different people and um, I, I guess understanding that there are certain types of people that are more likely to have, I guess, a whole, a whole bunch of these different problems. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've barely scratched the surface of these topics and we haven't talked about um, uh, the housing circumstances of, for example, indigenous people, people with disabilities. Um, we haven't talked about the fact that there are now more young people in the critical age cohort in 20, from 25 to 34 who are in private rental rather than in home ownership for the first time ever. So um, there's lots to discuss and we'd like to give you the opportunity of um, both um, making comments and asking questions. Um,
So who'd like to go first? I'd like you to, um, to introduce yourself and, um, and direct your comment or question to a particular panel member. Yes, over here, we've got some roving mics somewhere. There's a per <laughs> person sprinting down the, the stage now. Actually, I can give you this one. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is George Kudran. I'm from University of New South Wales, from Sydney, actually. <laughs> and uh, my question relates to the supply of housing, and in particular, supply of existing uh, housing, um, and how that will be impacted uh, by an aging population. I mean, with what we know with uh, quite a bit of certainty is that uh, older population in Australia will increase. Uh, you know, old age dependence ratio, which is the proportion of people age 65 and over to working age population, will more than double uh, in 50 years' time. So shouldn't that actually improve uh, affordability? Shouldn't that uh, put downward pressure on uh, house prices if there is basically more people who are likely to actually sell uh, downsize and smaller proportion of working age population demanding the housing? So, and if I can sort of have a follow-up question, second one, uh, that sort of would relate how the demand for housing and, and, uh, and the reason why people actually own the housing is related or sensitive to government policy. I mean, uh, you already mentioned uh, negative gearing related attached to investment housing, but also residential housing gets lots of benefits here, tax benefits, uh, and also it's uh, not subject to the asset test uh, for the age pension. So. Uh, if you maybe can make some comparison uh, with uh, countries in Europe um, and, and so on. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I think that's a great, you know, nested set of questions. I mean, the, um, the, the issue of demography and housing system is, re is really interesting, actually. Uh, um, and the truth is that the, we don't really know how behavior is going to change moving forward. Uh, but there was a, an infamous uh, housing economics journal article published in, in the late um, 1980s. Um, I won't mention the authors in case I get sued about it. Um, but basically, it predicted that in the US, uh, when the 1990s came, uh, house prices were sort of falling dramatically. Um, and the reason it made this prediction is because the baby boom population, or, uh, age cohort rather, would reach retirement age and begin downsizing uh, they'd move into retirement homes, they'd move to the seaside, and so on. Um, and of course, the, the generation coming after them is much smaller. So the demand uh, groups were going to be much smaller. There's going to be this huge supply of housing onto the market being sold um, as uh, the aging baby boom generation tried to free up uh, equity uh, to help their retirement. Uh, and of course, none of this happened. Uh, what actually happened in, in the late 1990s is the housing market boomed uh, internationally. Uh, so the very opposite thing happened. And of course, the reasons are that people, largely because people's behavior changed and it wasn't really expected. And it's very difficult to predict what will happen in the future. Uh, but certainly, you know, when um, the baby boom generation were buying their homes, when they were in the early 20s, the situation then for their parents and grandparents was very different. I mean, people retired at 65, having worked for 40 years, and they were lucky to live five or 10 years. Uh, and so that, kind of mo that modeled all of that behavior. And so people are living much longer now. Um, and also they've grown up in a, in a society where you can actually generate assets and save money. And so instead of selling housing lock, stock and barrel, what they did largely is try to keep it and keep it for the children, keep it for rental investments. Um, pensions began to go through a really hard time in the 80s uh, and devalued. And so it became stronger and stronger in the sense that it's actually better to keep these, uh, these investments to keep hold of those assets. Um, so I don't think we can make any judgment about what's going to happen in the future. I don't think it's likely that it's going to be a wholesale selling off of housing assets. Uh, I don't think that's likely. Uh, that's one thing that, uh, that history's taught us so far. Um, and what was your second question? Can you repeat it? The second question was uh, how sensitive uh, the, the, the housing demand and, and the reason why actually people uh, keep houses uh, 
uh, at older ages, for example, why they do not downsize uh, in Australia uh, as they do, yeah. for example, in, in, in Germany and mm -hmm. other countries. Yeah. How that is sensitive to government policy because you get lots of basically benefits through holding uh, on, on that asset in particular, housing asset. So my view is that I think, it's, I think we need to rethink about how much we're subsidizing housing, uh, particularly owner-occupied housing. Um, I think it is a, it's a hugely subsidized sector. And I think it's, th it's questionable to actually subsidize people who are already in a fairly good financial position and are generating wealth. Um, but I don't really think that uh, reforms will make a huge change because of these behavioral factors. I think people like owning housing, particularly older people. In theory, older people could downsize, but they don't want to. You know, they've they've, they've uh, developed this asset, they have a garden, they have space, you know, they like it, and, and they don't want to start um, moving to smaller property. The other thing that uh, is commonly forgotten, of course, is that uh, if you look at a younger households with one or two bedrooms, typically it's only them that live there. But the older generation tends to play a sort of, a, you know, custodial role in family. So uh, uh, children and grandchildren come to visit. So it's not really that as simple as under consumption. Um, so I think, going back to the main point, I think that it's largely it's a behavioural thing that people don't want to get, start giving up their housing assets and that tax concessions and reforms will only really make a marginal difference to that behaviour. Other questions? Yes, over here. Thank you. Um, my question is directed to Chris. Uh, there's uh, been a first homeowners grant in various iterations over the last 40 or so years that I can remember. What's your um, summation or uh, conclusion about its success or otherwise, or its um, intention ostensibly, or its actual intention? What's your summary of the first homeowners from an economics point of view? Uh, so I don't have a great uh, grasp of the evidence in Australia so far, but um, this sort of thing exists in many countries, uh, first home owner, owner grant. So I think that, um, in a I think in a sense, these demand side subsidies d tend to fuel price growth. So it does tend to actually capitalise the market in the end, which is a bit un unfortunate. Um, but I think they're generally a good idea in terms of trying to level the playing field so that younger people in particular can access home ownership. And I go back to the example I gave earlier. Um, and that when established people who have got housing equity, they've got wealth, apply for a mortgage, they get a much better offer, generally speaking, than younger people without credit history and without, um, uh, and without equity. So in a sense, the home owner grant, all it really does is level the playing field. Um, one thing I would say, though, is that um, as people are wealthier and more middle class and the social and human capital build up, they get pretty good at gaming the system uh, as well. So I think the evidence from the UK actually is, in particular, that measures to try and increase access to home ownership, they tend to give a further advantage to people who are already quite middle class, actually. Emma. Can I, can I just add to that? I think. The first home owner grant in its last kind of iteration in Australia it was really a great big untargeted subsidy to people who could already afford to get into the housing market. So I think, you know, in terms of the evidence, what it showed is that people whose um, parents could support them into getting into home ownership got a seven or a fourteen thousand dollar bonus. And what it did at the lower end of the market was it meant there was this whole area of the market that lower income people couldn't get into because higher income children <laughs> were buying up in that to, to take advantage of the $14,000 or whatever. So, you know, I, I'm not such a fan of, of the first time money grant. Mm. I think especially in rising markets, there's some evidence, um, especially in Melbourne, um, of a direct correlation with prices, especially in the outer suburbs. Um, we've got time for one last question. Yes, well, two. One here, then one here, we'll call it today. Yeah. Uh, Chris, um, hang on, I'll give you this. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Chris, in your opinion, if negative gearing were to be abolished, what impacts on rents do you think that would have? Um, so it's obviously quite difficult to predict that, but I would suggest that the outcome um, might be a little bit different to what politicians think. So the only real analogy I can think of uh, would be the UK in the sort of 60s and 70s, where the government tried to control rents 
by imposing ceilings on, on rents. So actually intervening in the market and saying rents aren't allowed to go up by X percent. Um, so what happened there, actually, of course, rents didn't rise because they weren't allowed to. What landlords did instead is they began to economize. So they economized on maintenance in particular. And so the private rental sector in the UK, which it started off quite vibrant, actually, um, you know, in the 50s, it wasn't bad. Uh, it began to be associated with poor quality um, slums, essentially. And that's a, a direct behavioral response from, from landlords. So my worry here would be that um, if the change is too quick, if there isn't a transition, that landlords might do something similar, actually, to start running down property quality to, inc to boost up their returns. And then we've got a different problem on our hands. It's important to stress that there are 36,000 dwellings which are subsidised by NRAS subsidies, um, which will be coming to an end over the next four years. So the investor behaviour arriving from that will be very interesting. One last question from over here. Thank you. I ha Tiana Nan, I'm a community member. I had a simple question about supply and demand. You obviously showed the housing supply as being a couple of percent and that comparing very well with international experience. How does that compare with migration as a percentage change to population each year as well? Are we growing a lot faster and hence is the deficit different? Um, who'd like to go first? Uh, well, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, so, uh, so I can only really answer kind of vaguely on this one because I don't have statistics to hand about migration flows, but my sense is that one of the reasons Australia has high housing supply is because it's actually got a lot of inward migration. Um, and, you know, I've personally contributed this, to this problem. <laughs> but, but <laughs> Uh, I confess I've got another house in the UK as well, which is, is disgraceful overconsumption. But, 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 you know, people do migrate and, uh, to Australia, and a lot of them actually uh, are looking for a better life. But actually, they've got skills. You know, the country's tried to, to bring in skilled people uh, who, who integrate into the workforce. Uh, and, you know, it's part of the problem, in a sense. Uh, but my sense is that the new build supply is, is higher because migration is higher. So I think if you were to take that out of the mix, I think it would be roughly the same as some other developed countries. It's really just a, a, an uninformed answer. Um, I'm sorry, there are a number of people with their hands up. We, will draw, we have to draw this to a close. I would just comment lastly um, in relation to the previous topic that in Melbourne we have added 1.2 million people in the last 10 years. Melbourne is currently adding 2,500 people a week. So those fundamental demand drivers are evident in those housing markets. Um, we've barely scratched the surface. We've had a fabulous presentation and some very interesting commentary. Please join with me in thanking our panelists here this evening. And I'll hand over to Jenny. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry for those of you, and I saw some other hands up there too, but you might be able to grab Chris before he leaves the room. So um, I'd also like to thank Professor Chris Leishman for giving us a bit of an insight into some housing economic issues and housing home ground disadvantage, as you've said in your talk. And also, again, if I could also join Michael in thanking our panellists, so Professor, Professor Michael Lennon, Associate Professor Emma Baker, and Dr. Lirian Daniel. I've got a small token from the university for each of you. Well, thank you very much. And of course, thank you to you, our audience members, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate you being here and thank you for those of you who got to ask your questions too. So that concludes tonight's event. Um, we'll be back on July 10th with a lecture entitled Food Innovation and I expect you'll hear from our researchers on how we're improving the taste, health benefits and accessibility of our food. So be here for that if you can. Thank you all for coming and good night. Thank you.